Hey, buddy. Morning, sunshine. What's happening? How's it going, bud? Thumbs up. Good. Thumbs man. up, Good. man. How's the fam doing? You know what? It's it's the tale of two. So you got Jackson who has to do online school. He gets up, he gets crack, and he gets his session in, and he's got his like little hour of work, and then he pounds it done. Then it's like, okay, I'm gonna go shoot pucks. He can still go out the backyard and hit golf balls. He went ride his bike. He's got his day planned. My daughter's a little bit more whimsical. She likes to like, uh, I'll do a little bit of school later. I'll get to it. And then she gets on her TikTok and then she plays the video games with her friend. But she's, she, they're great. They're just, they're just different humans, right? Like the golfers Good. we I'm teach. I'm your daughter. I'm your daughter. <laughs> yeah. I'm your yeah. daughter. Did you see the video I just posted in Mexico from a couple no. years ago? Oh, I it? That's the greatest golf school moment in the history of golf school. Oh, this is the best. It was the best. Yeah. But thanks hey. so much for coming on. I know we've got uh, we've got a lot of people tuning in already. Cool. Um, I just I, I know they all know you, but I just wanted to say a word about you. Um, this guy, tour striker. I I can't remember when we met. I think the first time we met was at some TrackMan seminar. Uh, at the yes. NBA show a hundred yeah, years I, ago. I came to watch you do your thing. You did awesome. Well, I don't know about that. That, that was a mistake. Uh, yeah. But uh, Martin is one of my best buddies in the world. We, uh, he has taught me so much. Uh, we have taught a lot Likewise. together. Uh, we teach a lot of the same type of golfers, and we really are running pretty parallel paths. And we just have a great time together. We've taught golf schools all over the world, it seems like. Yes. Um, Oregon to Mexico to Northern Ireland to <laughs> you name it. I mean, a bunch of places. We've had a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, told we've got some good stories. I'm sure some of them will come to come to the forefront here in this little session together. But Martin, one thing that you well, one of the many things that you do that really amazes me is teaching aids. You oh, are thanks, like the guru. You have become your name has become synonymous with great teaching aids. Well, you know, it's uh, my it's funny. The first time I tried to actually get something done, I think I was about 23 or four, a long time ago, 51, so a long time ago. And I had this, uh, you know, I liked, I kind of liked warming up with that swing fan. I don't know, it loosened me up, but I thought, I'm not going to travel with this thing. And I was playing in those days. And I thought, well, you know, if I could just have a portable one of those, pop it on my club for a couple minutes. So I made one up that folded around the shaft. It was like accordion style, then it went like this around the shaft. You know, you could put it together. And I showed it to some industrial designer, and he's like, yeah, we can make that. And I just kind of ran out of gas. Like, I just, I didn't, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have the money to do it. Obviously, my playing career didn't, like, you know, funnel in that much cash to be able to do something like that. <laughs> and so, you know, as I got older, I kind of, like, I got a few lucky breaks, and I figured out how to do that kind of thing, how to kind of go down the road to make sure I'm not infringing on somebody um, you know, de having a decent lawyer when you need one of those, mm. um, that's sort of affordable. I got one of those gratefully. And then, so, you know, years ago I had the intent, I couldn't do it. And then as I got a little bit older and then having a supportive wife, Stacy Chuck, AKA mama striker, I was able to, you know, kind of get the thing going. And now once you have the pattern in place, it's not that hard. And I get a lot of guys in here call me, you know, I always call my office hours when I'm in the car. I say, yeah. you know, call me and I'll walk you through it. Now, the one rule I always say is don't tell me what your invention is. If you patented it, you can tell me what it is. Great. But if you, if you just have some idea you're thinking of, guess what? I'm thinking of it too. And I don't want to have a conflict with you. So I'll happy, I'm happy to help you with, Good idea. with um, you know, just if you have questions about how to do something, questions about marketing, questions about, you know, what it should price for, stuff like that, cost value proposition, I can help with that. But I don't want to know what you're working on because I'm yeah, probably good. working on it. You know, good idea, uh, Martin. I, I thought it would be good if we could just banter and talk a little bit about. And, and firstly, you must be congratulated on your training aid empire because <laughs> plane mate <laughs> is off the charts. Training uh, aid of the year at the PGA show earlier. Thanks. Uh, just tremendous stuff, and it's amazing how many videos I watch on Instagram and social. And there's someone using a Martin Chuck deal, and I'm like, man. That guy, he's buying the Bud Lights next time we get together. You know it, and I'm happy to. <laughs> you know, shout out to my boy David Woods. Like you, he's one of my best mates. Sure. You know, it was one of those things where years ago on Revolution Golf, right, which, I mean, I, I miss that platform so much now. But, uh, well, I, you know, you think about what am I going to do the next week in this tip? And so with the rubber band deal, I tied on the shaft. 
Yeah. And Woodsy was the one who said, hey, man, if that thing went on a rail on your belt, now maybe you'd have some more, you know, ability to move that. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so we, him and I worked together on the plane mate. So he gets a, a good shout out for the, you know, for development sure. with me on that. But thanks, mate. You know, there I appreciate you go, it. Man. Good stuff. Good stuff. Martin, I thought it would be good for everybody if you and I could talk a little bit about, let's start out in, in, just in talking to the type of golfer, the demographic that we teach. And I mm -hmm. saw a classic question rolled through the screen earlier. And it was somebody asking, how can I swing to avoid lower back pain? And those are mm. the type of things we get often. Come on, uh, I'm going to let you take a shot at that one. You know, so I think about, I, I think some people are predisposed to back pain, to be honest with you. You could be like a guy driving a truck and have back pain. You could be some a uh, lady that that is doesn't have a doesn't do a lot of physical activity and have back pain so our bodies are predisposed to certain conditions yeah. the like i've never ever had back pain in golf ever i had a back pain putting up a wine rack one time seriously i was putting a wine rack in and i tweaked my back so like like my my thing is about back pain is if one never try to get you know this we always talk about this as a joke right never try to keep your head down and the shearing force of golf whipping past the stable head. Learn how to rotate and extend the, it properly with a good coach, and your chances of having back pain drop significantly. The, um, you know, the the elements of restricting your hip turn and the back swings. Another juicy one that was popular back in the day that I think now we know that, you know, let's let's kind of let the hips free wheel. Let's let the the trail hip get high. Let's try to have a, as much motion as we can. Um, so you know those two those two basic ones. But then, you know, I share, like, Mike Weir's my good buddy. There's a, there's a, uh, I'm in my studio now. I got to do some videos in here, naturally. But uh, there's a picture of Mike Weir up there. And Mike, when we were a kid, Mike had bad back. Like, he always had a bad back. And, and now, and he went through a nice regimen, like, every day. He was very, he'd get up, he'd stretch, he'd do his planks, he'd do certain things to help kind of fortify the, those areas that gave him problems. And luckily, you know, he was okay with his back. And then he hurt his damn forearm and really needed surgery on that. But, you know, he, um, you know, people, I think those couple of things I mentioned, what do you think, Andrew? I would say, yeah, spot on with what you said. I would totally agree. I think we've got to get the hips to work more with the upper body instead of having them oppose one another. Yeah. And then I would talk a little bit to that golfer about foot placement, maybe drop the trail foot back a little bit, maybe get yeah. a little bit of matching flair in each of the feet and go, Great point. Come on, let's get that working together instead of opposing. Yeah, no, I love that. I, I do see that. I see those toes that are very, you know, boxy. And then, yes. and then for the older folks, it's like, okay, not even the older folks. And I think you're going to see something like, you know, most people's trail foot now, good players, it's kind of leaving the ground and rotating out and back. I love watching like Preston Summerhays hit it. You know what I mean? This kid yeah. and, and David Wood's little kid, Austin, it's just relocating out away from the target line. Maybe I can't do it. I'm not that good. But the point is like, you see, you'll see the long driver guy with a trail foot flared back and the lead foot square, because this one's going to leap out of the way anyway. Yes. And the back one flared lets them have a little bit more range of motion in the back swing. So you're seeing this, these interesting foot patterns that aren't the common, ben, you know, Ben Hogan squared off back foot, flared open foot. Because the more you open your lead foot, the, the more externally rotated it is already. You can't turn deeply, but that foot flared way open. So it's almost like wear shoes with no nubbies, right? So you get some slippage, which is welcome. Just be careful walking down any hills. Yes. You know, and let the let the the nubby shoes kind of slip around a bit, but too much for, front foot flare, I think, limits how much you can turn. That hip starts to get locked up. So a little, the toe, a little bit, little bit flare in the front, a little bit more flare in the back. Open those hips. I think those older folks that we teach primarily, you know, yes. I say older, my age, and a little bit older, right? Um, Unfortunately, this is true. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Martin, what? What are some of the patterns? I'm doing some webinars. I did one for the LPGA last night. I've got PGA Italy today. I've got PGA nice. Ireland today. And so I'm doing some webinars and we're talking about patterns that I see. And I know the same things that I see are the same things that you see, certainly. And what's the, give us a couple of biggies and, and just some ideas as to how you work to help those players overcome that. Yeah, so the, you know, I'll do my best in the small window, right? is, you know, lead arm pinned across the chest. So the, 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 go the golfer always wants to hit it farther, no, no doubt about it. Yes. And these, these golfers don't have elevation, right? They have this. They don't want to slice it, so they take it way back. They pin it across their chest. 
oftentimes their lead arm is even below their shoulder, their shoulder pitch, right? Yeah. And now they're trying to develop speed from there. And my joke is you cannot get your Ferrari up to speed in a Starbucks parking lot. You need more room to run, man, right? So we're trying to get the, and you said this a long time ago, and I stole it, of course, handle displacement, displacement mm. with your South African accent. Like I want you to see, to get that thing up. You know, of course we want depth, but we want up. And that's where like the plane mate's been amazing for the older folk is that, you know, you, it, you're fighting something. So you're becoming more familiar with where that fight takes width. you, that range of motion you're capable of. Yeah, width, width and depth, right? Yeah. And then, you know, naturally early in the back swing, we see this over lead arm because again, they want to hit that draw and they don't understand how to let a club kind of shallow and orbit inside out with rotation. And you don't have to open up like Lee Trevino, man, that'd be nice, yeah. but you just got to understand a little bit of shallow so that when you do unwind a bit, the club is kicked inside out. You don't have to try to shovel it inside out. Yes, stand and push those arms out, which is a mm. big, right? Which is a biggie. Uh, Martin, one of the things that I see on my lesson here, I know you get this because we've discussed this, is that really steep start to the downswing, really steep early transition. And it's a hot term, mm. and it's been a hot term for a long time, shallowing the club. I'm not sure that's really a great term. It's let's just get the club in a better downswing position. How do you go right. about helping people with that other than using the plane mate, which is great for that? You know, I mean, well, then I, of course, I give them a smart ball. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You know, so it's funny, like all these, all these uh, training aids come out of my frustration for sharing my idea and trying to get my idea across the fastest. So, you know, external, you know, internal, external feels. So, you know, if arms are separated, you know, elbows separate, wrists get too bendy. If wrists get too bendy, shaft pitches vertical, elbows get a little closer together, you have a better chance of having a lead wrist that manages the face better, right? So when you explain this behavior to somebody, and then the problem is some of those, some of those somebodies that we teach, like the club golfer, that club member golfer, they may have limited mobility. Like the first thing I'll do is I'll say, okay, what kind of mobility do you have in your arms? And the guy said, well, I fell off my motocross back when I was 22 and busted at my shoulder and he can't move his arm. Right. So then right away, you know, he's going to be in a position where, man, you better use some like momentum and inertia to help that shallow. That's where like a Gigi, I love the, like a Matthew Wolf, that club out and then a little bit of rotation might help that club pitch back. So depending mm -hmm. on the student, like, Justin Rosal, you know, he can go up there and he can kind of manage his arms and the club is beautiful. Some guys need a little bit of momentum to get the club back there, but I'll try to educate them first, right? So that they understand like this, there's no way that it's, you have no time to get this out. I've seen some good golfers yeah. get it out late, but you have no time. So when you have no time, then you're highly unpredictable, right? So if we try to assemble something a little bit more meaningful at the top, then they have more time in the point two five point three seconds to get that face on the ball so that that face vector is not pointing all over the place and that they're not stare and stand and deliver as you say right so mm -hmm. a little bit more organized here gives the club a chance to have a, a better orbit into the ball and would you say in particular because a lot of the golfers that we teach don't have long backswings oh the shorter the backswing the more important it is that the player gets the club head and the club face organized and in position so that they can make that appropriate dancing. Are you talking about me right now? Is this like a stab at me? Are you saying <laughs> Not that? Not at all, Pots. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> no, I hear you. So like long back swings are great because, they, you know, you have, even if it's, you know, Freddie Couples, right? Like he gave himself some interesting yeah. things, strong turned grip, right? Reasonable hand, very kind of, but he gave himself time to have mm -hmm. things line up nicely. If you don't create time, then, I mean, you can get away with stuff. Bobby Jones, a beautiful, I forget how he stated it, paraphrased, like something about, you know, the backswing short, you need time to fix, your thing, fix the issues. Well, if you don't have that mobility and you, can't create, and, you, and you can't create that length, you better make it sort of nice, decent hands, okay, wrist conditions if you have a short swing because you're a little bit older. So those, you know, those coaches out there, like, that, that, you know, either going to teach a lot of kids or they're going to teach a lot of club members. That's what they're going to face, right? That sweet yeah. spot of athlete from 20 to 35 or 40. Those folks are trying to grind and make a living. They're usually not spending that much disposable income on lessons. You're either going to teach the kids who are hypermobile and that's all great. You're going to have your own, your own set of um, stuff you see with those. Like you see those hips fire super fast. And yeah. Clubs way back here. We, you know, that's the, the junior golf pattern, I call it. Or, you know, the older guy that, you know, loses mobility. 
that needs to work on it. And we use bands and different things to help people kind of understand those fields. So good point. Yeah. You know, Martin, I, I, I was talking last night and I said to somebody, I said, I have nothing against long swings. In fact, I like long swings. The, the two ways a player can generate club speed is by increasing the amount of force that they're running through the club via the handle. Yeah. Like a Tony Finau. Right. Or increasing the amount of time that they're exerting the force on the handle. And if you look at a John Daly or a Bubba Watson, they've got that long backswing. And so they've got tons of time to ramp up the energy in the club head. And, and really, long swings are not bad as long as the player is not, as long as we're not playing the flute, we're not letting go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Playing the flute there. Uh, I don't need let. I don't like letting go, and I don't like losing structure in the arms. Would you agree with that? Oh, uh, totally, absolutely. You know, it's it. Every once in a while, you'll get because you know I call it jackknifing, and it's um, like mm -hmm. a tractor trailer pulling the cargo, right? Like if it puts the yeah. brakes on, and then you get that jackknifing situation. So sometimes, what's funny is a uh, big Jim, Jim Waldron, like the long, or, you know, big Jim, long drive guy. Yeah. He's, his speed's getting back up. He's kind of getting ready to go. Mind you, there's. He can still hit golf balls in Arizona. He can hit golf balls in ranges. You do social distancing on ranges and stuff. So it's, you can still get outside gratefully. Um, the, when I, he, he works on this crazy, crazy long swing, right, yeah. to, to try to get as much force jackknifed as hard as he can. But he's got to hit one good ball in eight. You know what I mean? We have to play a game where we hit a, a golf ball that goes in a cone of reliability out there every time and we can't do it right so we're trying to build like a pattern that is more reliable than say a long drive pattern but no i'm with you like long swings are great as long as again you don't put too many things in that you can't get out right because we need we need to get the face kind of pointed where we want the ball to go without you know and, and i think you gotta, coaches, go find it. you gotta find it right and i think we've got to get this trail arm most people don't realize you, you know great players they don't hit a golf ball with a straight trail arm they hit a golf ball with a bent trail arm a soft trail wrist and the you know in the act of straightening and it's like if you can get to that magic position of how to transport that timing of collecting a golf ball with a soft trail wrist a soft trail arm now you've got a little bit more control of how that face is flashing through where the golf ball is those folks that hang you know have that look yeah man that falls all over the place yeah they're chasing control, it eh? yes Active club face through impact, not a good thing. You and I know mm. a little bit about that. Um, active <laughs> club face, yes. Our, our club faces need to be less active. Uh, Martin, you and I are two of the few golfers that really teach a number of three-day golf schools during the course of right. this year. Two or three-day golf schools. We teach golf schools. And I know before I started teaching those three-day golf schools, I thought to myself, well, Three-day golf schools are really just too much information. It's an information dump, and the student's going to be overloaded, and it's not really going to help. And then I started teaching three-day golf schools, and I have a very, very different view on three-day golf schools. I want to, I'm going to say mine, but I want you to go first. I know you love three-day golf schools and their effectiveness. I see tremendous upgrades made by my students and your students alike. Why do you like three-day golf schools, and, and, and how can any golfer benefit from that? You know, to, to me, it's immersive, right? It's, a, it's one, I do a little spiel where they come in, and, and, you know, again, the client range could be, there might be some young folks in it. Like, sometimes a client will bring their kid who's 20 or 16 or 12 or whatever, but usually it's adults, right? And I'll joke, and I'll, I have a Harry Potter magic wand. It's sitting over there, and I'll get my magic wand out, right? And I'll go, you're all freshmen in high school because... I go, what do you mean? Because I'm going to tell you stuff that I care about your game deeply. I want you to get really good. And if you were a freshman in high school and you want to play for my golf team, and I'm that kind of grizzled old coach, but you see all those banners we won, state championship banners, that's because I groomed a team. My juniors and my seniors, they're awesome. They're going to play. You're probably not going to play this year. But I'm going to give you stuff that's going to help you get really good. And then you're going to make me look good when you make the team. So I always joke with them, I want you to make the team. Because I'm going to say that they're going to have all these things we're talking about, whatever adjustments we make. Well, in an immersive environment, I can give them proof. We can get them on gears really quickly, some track man numbers, foresight inside here. We got a pressure plate. We do, we're doing everything to kind of build a case to say, okay, listen, here's you have an awesome opportunity to get really good. Now, in a three-day immersive school, you know, you can work on 
being really mindful about maybe cleaning up some of this stuff, you can work on feeling how pressure can change a little differently, right? And, and then we stop you. And then we say, hey, let's go talk about a flop shot. Let's go talk about how to get this ball, you know, from this funny lie close to the hole. Because let's face it, the peripheral skills in golf, we develop that peripheral skill. Like we can hit it under a tree like I do so often, but I can get it out from under there by the front of the green, chip it on, make par and go, on. okay, par, let's go, next hole, yeah. right? So what's cool is in, a, in an immersive environment, we can build them the platform. We use the same platform coach now. And here's, okay, here's your primary fixes. You may not get that completely in three days. I get it, but you know what it is. Your questions have been answered. Here's your homework. Now let's go do peripheral skill stuff. Answer questions about how to get this ball to roll on the green and stop by that pin from a basic chip. Because a lot of people don't know how to do it. Or they got the shaft way back and they're stabbing down into the ground. They don't know how to use the bounce. So in a one-hour lesson, yeah, you might be able to touch on something. But it's not, it doesn't surround all the questions the golf, the golf game asks you. And then it's yeah. nice to see fellow suffering. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to see other people with the same issues. Yeah. Right? Like I like to take, we have my coaches and you know them all. We take the group and put them in pods with either Aaron or Brian or Jim or Mike. And they might be the steep and deepers with Mike. You know, it might be the foot people, that, the, the better players that want to work on just short game stuff. Maybe they get Brian this week. Right? And then I'm always kind of the seagull fluttering around. Right? But I mean, it's, I like it because it's immersive. You get questions, you have banter, and you can help develop their idea of a better overall game, not just the maybe primary fix they need over three days. Yeah, totally agreed. I, what became clear to me after teaching three-day schools for a couple of years is that golfers got it. They left, and it wasn't so much the amount of information, it was a the repeat of the same information and painting the right. picture as to this is what you need day one. This is the same thing you need on day two. <laughs> this is the same thing you need on day three. And by the time we get to day three, uh, I, Pete and I, the, Pete who worked with me, we would always joke, mate, I see the hairs getting a bit long, much like, oh, dude. Much like mine it's, here. it's a you cabbage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm getting some cabbage going. Um, <laughs> Pete and I would joke that we loved day three because on day three, the student would say, listen, get away from me. You've told me that already. I don't right. need to hear that anymore. I know what I need to do. And that's and like, I think, that, I think that's so important. Yeah, that's so no. important. That, that's what I'm looking for. So that the, the student, when they leave, they have this crystal clear picture and image as to what they need to do. And they're going to go home. Their expectations are in line with reality. And they're going to go home and they understand it's a game plan. It's a process. I've got to work the plan. And if I hit that shot, aha, I know. I went back to my old swing. If they hit that shot, they go, okay, I'm starting to make progress. Don't you find it funny that you know, they, 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 they think you're holding something back? Like maybe, maybe, hey, maybe there's something else. What about, no, 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 just let's clean this up. What do you mean? Just, no, no, let's just clean this up day two. Let, let's just do a bit more of this. Yeah. Because they think that there's like 85 things. There's not 85 things. There's just a couple things. Yeah. And if you really do those couple things nicely, you'll clean up a lot of what, what makes you unhappy when you play golf. 100%. 100%. And, and I think three-day schools and, you know, a lot of golfers don't teach, a lot of golf coaches don't teach three-day golf schools. But this can be this long-term program that you get your students on. And for golfers, get yourself in a long-term program. Or go and see Martin or come and see me uh, for a three-day golf yeah. school. Shameless plug right there. Uh, but here's what you're going to get from that. Like, I loved your word, immersive. That immersive program is you're going to have a clear picture as to what your package is. And you're going to stop surfing the internet and watching Instagram and YouTube for this magical fix because you're going to know what your package is. You know, and I would say that, you know, we the, the, the continuity program that most quality coaches do now, whether, what app, whatever continuity app they use, we use Coach now. You know, it's so nice when, I, and I say, I te literally one part of the golf school is teaching them how to take their own video and post it to their training space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have to take their phone out because a lot of people are like, what? what's an app? I oh, oh what I do? You know, and they'll look at their phone because it's an age-related thing, right? And I always joke, hey, if you can't do this, give it to your grandkid. They'll, they'll post the picture for you, no problem, right? Yeah. I, I make them take their phone, 
click open on the app and, and take a video and post it in the app. And then I say, hey, guess what you just posted? That comes right to me. When it comes yeah. right to me, I kind of take a look at it and I go, <laughs> or I go, hey, way to go. And, I, and maybe I might turn the camera around and show you a thing or two or where, where you're setting up or what I want the club to do. Or I'll just say, hey, way to go. Post again in a couple of weeks. Let me keep an eye on you. And those little simple checkups are fantastic. I mean, you know, you can give the fist bump on Coach Now. Mm. Or if you have to have a comment, you just do a quick voiceover with a line or two. And they feel you got this relationship that is ongoing. This year, if it wasn't for COVID, shutting the golf school down, this dude was coming back for his seventh year in a row. Okay? Awesome. Seventh year in a row. And, and he just likes coming down with coaches and working on his game. The funny thing is sometimes I'll get a guy who can beat me at the golf school. I'm like, why are you here? He goes, yeah. well, I, I, I like your style, and I just want to work hard for three days. And, and it's just a teeny – he, he might say something like – one guy in particular was a Utah State senior champion. He goes, I just kind of want to work on flighting my wedges. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And that's what we did. And he putted. And he, he hit a lot of full shots too. And there wasn't much to add. He drove it as straight as you can point, you know, 260 yards. Mm. But it was like the wedges were just – you know, he worked on, he was a little steep, you know, so he worked on some shallowing for his wedges, and that's all he wanted. Most of our clients, as you know, hit the slice. They don't have low point control. You know, they don't, they, they're, they, don't have, they don't have the right pressure shift, those kind of things. So we softly yeah. try to inject that without overwhelming them with, you know, uh, thoughts that we can, verbiage we can use among coaches that I don't ever use with my students, right? Yeah. I don't want to talk. I don't want to sound like a doctor to somebody that's just trying to go break 90 and have fun. I don't want to. I want them to kind of have basic general themes that they can run with and, and not get too um, into, you know, terminology that, as I can describe with a coach or a medical professional, right, and um, leave, leave, leave that stuff for them and leave fun, fun dialogue for, for students that want to go play once a week. For sure, for sure. So, Martin, we've got to tell a few stories. Oh, okay. We've got to tell a few stories. And I'm so, starting. And so uh, you I, can start, start if you want. You want to start? <laughs> yes. So I'm going to go on my Instagram and I'm going to go into my story and I'm going to repost you singing um, you two in, in the, the, um, the Harbor Bar in Port Rush. <laughs> Obviously, you were, <laughs> I'm going to say a half, maybe five, half dozen pints deep by then. They and this the Ricky, pints, though. What, what they were the wee pints. What yeah. was Ricky's name? Ricky, the it's singer guy. Good. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna post him too. So I'm gonna post you singing because I saved it. It's hysterical, and I'm gonna <laughs> tag Ricky. And so check my story later today because you'll enjoy Andrew Rice singing you two with like heartfelt oh. like ripper. It was awesome. I mean, in Ireland, it was just epic with the Guinness. Yes. Um, it was epic. <laughs> and and yeah. okay, so it's it's funny how most of our stories just go back to Ireland and we've had multiple uh Irish expeditions together. <laughs> but the one that seems to stand out to me was the night out after coach camp in Dublin. Oh. <laughs> um. <laughs> when we went to the Temple Bar district and and we got into St. Well, John who, tell, tell and, who we were with too. Mark Crossfield. Crossfield and my wife Terry was there. Yes. Crossfield was with us. And so we go into this bar and there's this great band playing. <laughs> and we've all had a few too many beers. And so I say, I shout out to the band, you know, can you play this, um, you know, se seven drunken nights? And so Mar <laughs> Martin's like, yeah, here you go. And he gives the guy like a $50 bill or 50 pound <laughs> note or something like that. The guy's like, Oh man, how long would you like me to play it for? And you didn't even realize you gave him like a fifty or something like that. I remember it was a big, it was a big bill, and he was very happy. And we listened to that one song and then left and went and bought a pizza and got on the bus. Right? <laughs> That's right. So my 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 personal joke whenever somebody's playing live music because it goes back to one of my oldest friends growing up. It was like Stairway to Heaven. If you can get a mariachi band to play Stairway to Heaven that's like a, like a big win between it's a joke between another buddy of mine. And so that night with that dude, I said to my, that's why I gave him some grease. And I wanted him to play your, your song. And you were, <laughs> there's another one where you're all closed eyed singing. Right. And then I t walked up to this guy in this bar in Ireland and said, would you play stairway to heaven? And he's looking at me like, really, you're going to make me do that. I'm like, yes, I am. Here you go. Right. Oh, and of course God. he played like four bars of stairway to heaven. He's like, that's it. I'm done. You oh, know, God, but I had to do that, it for my buddy back home. Yes.
Good days, mate. Good days. I look forward to being on the road with you again one of these days. Soon. Yes, hopefully. I know. Let's get this virus behind us. Soon. We will. We will. It'll happen. Uh, it, it has always happened, so I suspect we're going to keep our streak alive of overcoming. Yes. Martin, short game. You and yeah. I have discussed short game and wedges and, and those type of shots for the everyday golfer, that average mm. club golfer. What are some of the patterns and the trends that you see and you see people think and come up with? What are some, you know? You know, it's funny. I've here. got, um, it, it's, it's so, I always call it the Christopher Columbus syndrome, okay? If I was trying to raise money for Cl Christopher Columbus in 1490, I'd be going around saying, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to invest in me because my guy Christopher is going to get on this boat and he's going to go that way to get this way, right? And people are going to be, you're crazy because if you go on a boat that way, you're going to go off the end of the planet because I can see the end, right? And so everybody, especially that, that club golfer, they think that, man, every time they miss, oh, I lifted up, I peaked, I, you know, I got quick or whatever, they have, this, they have these few common phrases that are rubbish that have nothing to do with why they missed. So, you know, I have this student that came to see me. He's been coming to see me regularly now for a few years. I'm so proud of him because he's gotten really good. And he plays in the AM Tour and he shoots under 70 now. And he couldn't shoot under 80. And he's like 60 right. years old. And he couldn't, I couldn't watch him pitch. Every time he tried to hit a pitch, I went, oh, oh. like I had to make a face because it was one of the most, you know, one of these things. And now, you know, I showed him Anna Kassorenstam. You know, I showed him how lovely like this she pitches and her eyes are not even looking at the golf ball and how she elevates her chest and how she creates room for her long arms so that this club can potentially have a nice radius at the bottom right mm -hmm. and and to try to share that message with somebody is like trying to share that the earth is not flat and they because for as longer than we've known it to be round it was flat to the people who lived here right so to get people to learn how to kind of push away from the ground with longish arms so that there's room for their club to have a nice negotiable relationship with the ground where the ball lives. That's like, that's huge. And it's, it's hard to, it's hard to teach because it's like telling somebody who's afraid of heights, Hey, you'll be safe at the top of the empire state building. Let's go up and check it out. <laughs> no, I don't want to go, you know, yeah. but I mean, that's really like, to me, that's a huge one. And once people realize like, it's okay for this unit to keep moving and have some rise, then, you know, they'll have a chance to hit some good shots rather than stay down, stab at it, maybe get lucky once in a while. And the problem is you do get lucky once in a while. So you, you get yep. this reward and it's hard to break that from folks. But, and I know we're talking the same language here. For sure. Know. For sure. Uh, we tend to speak the same language when it comes to any part of the swing or any part of the game, really. We spend that much time together. Uh, when it comes to the short game, you know, one of the big, killers that i've seen over the years martin has been that old idea of let's get the ball back let's get the weight forward let's get the handle forward and stay down and you you spoke about the stay down part and right i've got to tell everybody that we need to get over that we need to get away from that uh mm, the goal amen should not be back in the stands excessively at least it should not right. be back in the stance you don't want a tremendous amount of forward shaft lean coming into the golf ball you cannot pinch the ball between the club face and the turf that just doesn't happen 100 <laughs> percent. you know i, I had, I had yeah. brad fax and send me a video of rocco mediate a few weeks ago and he said this guy is amazing and i know where brad plays at old palm down in florida that turf is as tight as can be. And he showed me this video of Rocco hitting these wedge shots, and it's like butter. The, the club's just gliding along the ground. He said he can spin it, he can high it, he can low it, he can do whatever. And it looks to me like Rocco is doing, it looks like Rocco's going this way. Right. No, yeah, I've seen it. Like it's he's crazy. Going that way. His club is and skidding along the ground. How, how many inches would you say his club is skidding along the ground? Six to eight. Yeah. Six right. to eight. And it really was an eye opener to me because if I'd have seen that 20 years ago, I would have said that is horrendous. I would have had to look away at the good results. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, I think we've come a long way. The golf instruction community has come a long way in our understanding of so many different parts of golf instruction, short right. game being one of them. We've got a ways to go. We're not all the way there yet, but we're getting much, much better. And 
I would have looked at Rocco 20 years ago and said, that's completely wrong. You've got to change it. I would have looked at DJ, believe it or not, DJ who went to university in Myrtle Beach, yep. Coastal Carolina. DJ at one point was, this is a long, long time ago, was in the car on the way. I, I used to teach in Bluffton, South Carolina. He was in the car on the way to come and take a lesson from me. And something came up, there was an accident or something, and he had to turn around and go home. And I'm always thankful that that <laughs> happened. <laughs> because, because when he, at the time that he was coming to me, and if I'd have seen that action, I would have said, no, go, we need to change that. And he either would have just left five minutes into the lesson, or I would have wrecked him. Uh, so neither one would have been a good experience for either of us. And I'm just thankful for that because the golf coaching community, we understand things so much better, so yeah. much better now. No, I would agree. I think that, uh, it, I don't know necessarily, like nobody's born in a vacuum, right? You're only, you are a, you're made up of what your experiences have been, okay? So, you know, if you grow up in a traditional teaching environment, I'm actually jealous for the teachers that grew up today. You know, like we're the yeah. same age, give or take. I had my mentors, they were great. Um, but, you know, to your point, you, you know, the, the catch word, you know, matchups or whatever on how risk conditions work, you know, it, it, DJ's got some, some – the ability for DJ to do this and have a long swing is fascinating. Most people cannot you know, do what he does, you know. So the fact that – and it was funny having the maestro, Joe Mayo, you know, with us in Europe that time. You know, he's so – he's a great speaker and hysterically funny in his in – his, I don't even know how he expressed that manner of, of how he carries himself, but it's hysterical and it's fun to watch. But, you know, that when this wrist does get – all the way bowed like this, you know, it, it therefore cannot have any hinge, right? So most of our club players are trying so hard to create this sense of power and distance by going so hard this way. And again, now they've just twisted the shaft and I've got the little nubbies from gears on here. They've just twisted that shaft so much that that twist has to be, you know, untwisted by the time they get to the golf ball. Mm -hmm. And DJ's kind of done the opposite. He's made things so neutral that you know, there's not a whole lot of twisting by the time he gets things from his massive bow down to something kind of neutral and impact and then, you know, massively extended cuppy post impact. Right. But I agree with you. Like I, I'd be guilty too. I would, my preferences when I was a kid, obviously I loved watching George Newton hit it because he was my mentor. I loved watching like anything Ben Hogan. I've got the Ben Hogan life magazine here. I've got five of his five fundamental books from different um, um, publication dates and stuff. So obviously I was, I had my favorite kind of models. And I think as a coach, we got to be careful, but we don't just try to stop everybody into our model. Now, you know, what do you need? You definitely need the, you know, the club to touch the ground at the right place. You need, you know, the face has to be manageable for people, you know, and there's a lot of like Mike and Andy, the stack and tilt guys had some great little summary bits to say, here's what you need to play good golf. Right. And some of yeah. their things, some great stuff in stack and tilt model, even as, people smash that smash that a lot but i'll tell you what you take somebody that's going to play golf once a week and they haven't figured out the rhythm of how to change pattern how to put pressure in certain times of where the weight of the swings inspiring them man they can go out and play pretty good golf with a little bit yeah. of weight in their lead side and hitting just straight arms because now they're not shrinking a radius they're not doing things that they're physically incapable of doing i would tell you that you are a good athlete i'm a good athlete um, yeah. And like, not great, good. I played sports all my life. I still play men's league hockey. I suck now because I'm not very fast anymore. But we, we're teaching people sometimes that, you know, aren't great athletes. Or maybe they think yes. they are, but they're not. You know, yeah. and it's like we got to give them a workable solution to help them enjoy getting the golf ball from A to B a little bit better and answering their questions about how the golf ball gets in the hole from a variety of conditions, right? That's coaching. Yeah. And not just teaching. So, anyway, I went on a rant there, and I and I think I lost your first. I, I lost your question. So no, that's okay. That's okay. I like to listen to you, brother. You got a good voice and and good reasoning. <laughs> I, I think you, if I go on a little bit of a rant, I think so much of coaching is experience. Right. It's knowledge, but then you've got to take that knowledge and try to plug it into the student. And when I spoke with Chris Como about a week ago, Chris said, as a coach, we're essentially a professional problem solver 
Yeah. And we need to express that to the student. We're not going to get it perfect every time. We need to have a giant toolbox of knowledge that we can tap into and dig around in and go, I think this wrench is going to work best for you based mm -hmm. on my experience. And I never understood from a long time ago why the best coaches in the world were always older. Why did they have to be older? <laughs> experience. experience. You can hide more tools in the deep wrinkles. That's yes. why. Yes, and you and I had a great discussion the one day we were, I forget where we were driving. And I think I started and I said to you, Martin, do you remember the last time you thought this coaching thing? I got this. This golf swing, I don't know if I can know any more. You know, and we both kind of <laughs> laughed out loud because in the, in the early days, I distinctly remember, and you agreed, I distinctly remember thinking to myself, I got this thing. Right. And we both chuckled at the fact that it's been decades since either of us have thought we've got this thing. Oh. Because the older you get, the more experienced you get as a coach, the more you realize you don't have everything. You don't know it all. And there's more stuff to learn and there's a long ways to go in coaching. But I think I've got to take my hat off to the coaching community with the Internet we are now able to share some tremendous information and stuff like this. I mean, what would the value of something like this be 20 years ago? Oh, it'd be, it'd be unbelievable. And, I, and that, I remember that conversation actually. And it's like, I do remember even saying, man, uh, you know, I've got it figured out. I'm like, uh, yeah. I look back now and I go, man, what a moron I was. <laughs> I, a you know, but I, I, and I, and I guarantee you there's some young coach out there who's, who, you know, and you got to, you got to have some bravado and some belief in your abilities and knowledge, right? And and it's not to say I I, I want to, if some really good player, and I get, to, I get the odd, I get to consult some tour players and the odd really good player come see me. And, and that's an interesting one, those kind of lessons, because you have to have confidence that you know that when you look and you, and those players all watch a little bit longer than say somebody who's just got the wide open face at the top, because I can kind of dig in right away on that. That's yeah. easy. You watch a really good player there you know you're not going to see something that crazy you might i might look at some numbers i'm like okay hmm, what's going on here to where they're unhappy with their ball flight after you watch one ball go pew, 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 and they're sending it right yeah that's where some experience really kind of matters because now if you come at the game from a you know you played at a high level i played at a high level and now it's almost like your parts shrink too because you yeah. you know how they've suffered in this sense of when they feel this pressure of performance, right? And pressure of performance can happen at like the D, D division in men's league too. But pressure of performance when you're kind of playing for your living and you're a coach and you go, okay, you know, I see a little something there, but I'm not jumping in on that right now because that dude or gal has to play next week, right? So I'm going yeah. soft, to softly kind of interject a little bit here that maybe we'll get this idea of cleaning up a little something down the road so they can kind of play through that a little bit and not freak them out because the last thing I want to do when they're trying to play and they're in their creative zone of getting ball A, a to B is have them thinking something technique which takes them out of their you know freedom to go A to B now a club player I might go get right in there show them a primer move like we like to you know practice swing feel that's yeah. really kind of priming their change on the golf course I'll dig in with them because, you know, I always joke with somebody that comes to the golf school and, and, and I always have them write down their best score. And if they wrote down 90, that means they shoot 100 every day they play. And 90 is like when all the planets align. Yeah. I tell them, you know what? Do you really want to cuddle that 90 or that, that 100? Who cares? It's 100. Give up on that 100. Okay. That's not yeah. defining you. You can be, you know, you can be much better than that if you just tear the band aid off and get to it. A tour yeah. player, I'm not going to have them tear the band aid off right away. I'm going to say to them, listen, let's kind of softly go into this. This is the long-term goal of that. But these are small little things. And the better the player, usually it's like, like I had a good talk with Nick Taylor yesterday. And Nick, what are you working on? He's like, I'm working on my alignment. You know, I'm working on how I walk into the ball and, and I get my eye. You know, and Nick's, Nick, he, back in the day when I worked with him for a couple of years, it was always we try to get his eyes a little less cockeyed to the right so because he yeah. tend to get his path going goofy, right? So how simple – the better a player gets, you know, we're work walking in and just kind of working on his eye, you know, his eyes alignment. Whereas somebody maybe 
doesn't know how to grip it, they've got that great inner locker that gives them that right hand, looks like they're holding a baseball bat, you know, some refinement. That's hard to change, man. You know, you got to yeah. do that. That's why a three-day golf camp, they get to walk in, they get to put their hands on nicely for three days. And I used to jo I, uh, I joke, but I say it all the time. I say, if you paid me two grand for three days and you walk away with a nice pair of hands, it's been well worth it. And they yeah. look at me like, well, I want way more than that. I go, well, guess what? I know you do, but if, if you do this nicely, a lot of the other stuff kind of falls in a little more, you know, a little easy, easier. So, again, I went on a rant. Sorry, dude. Do it all the time. No, I like it. That's what, this, that, that's what these things are all about. And, you know, just I, I know a lot of people watching are posting some really cool comments. So, thank you so much for tuning in to all the golfers and coaches who are tuned in. We sincerely appreciate it. And yes. Mark Crossfield said it last week. He said this. He said, as this lockdown extends, you're going to see golf coaches getting online and just giving stuff away. And that really is the case. It's not like we would expect to be paid for just bantering to each other with everybody else listening in. But golf coaches love to teach. They love to help. And ultimately, that's what it's all about. It's not about the money. It's nice to make money, and we should be concerned with generating revenue for what we know and what we can share. But ultimately, as golf coaches, we just want to help, and we just want to essentially make people better, whether they're a coach or whether they're a golfer. I get up every day, and I, when I go to the golf course, I'm, I have this little, like, happy tingle. You know, so you're so blessed yeah. when you show up at work and you're ready to, like, you can't wait to go, okay, what am I going to see today? You know, and I get, a, I get a kick out of the hard cases, the, you know, the, the, the shut face steep guy that's played reasonable golf, you know yeah. what I mean? Or the, or the good player who's, who, who can't hit a fade, right? Like those kind of, those kind of challenges to me, like when I go to work, it, it's like, I, I never feel like I'm working. I can spend the whole day you know, on the range in a school environment, teaching somebody doing whatever. And it's, I'm so blessed to be able to do what I do because it's such a fun thing for me to do. Like from the last minute I teach to the first minute I teach, I still feel like, all right, let's go. You know, and then when yeah. I get home, Jackson's like, all right, dad, let's go. What are we doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay, let's go. And That'll it's... keep you young, mate. That'll keep yeah, you young. For sure. For sure. So, Martin, I've got to ask you, let's talk a little bit of golf. You and I have played some golf uh, all in, in a couple of different cool places in the world. We got, uh, we got waxed by these two coaches, <laughs> Chris Carvel <laughs> and Steve Gordon from Northern Ireland. Cheaters. It seems like Cheaters. two years ago. Now, yes. they, they really they got lucky. They, they scraped it around and, and just hold mega putts on the last green, it seemed like, every day. Yeah, But if you could go and play golf anywhere based on the courses you've played or the courses you've read about, where would you like to go and play? Man, you know what? I, I, love, I love coastal, windy, linksy golf. My, my bucket list now, I'm so jealous of your Australia golf, okay, because that's where I kind of want to go. I want to go play those yeah. really hard. I want to hear my ball land from 170 yards away. That's what I want. Like, okay. to me, when a green is rock hard and fast, and every shot is like a, a series of calculations, now the, it's, 36 holes of that would kill me, but 18 holes of windy, firm greens, really thoughtful shots, I love that, right? So I've had oh, some experience yeah. with that at Bandon Dunes, although it's not the green speeds in Australia. But, man, that to me would be like, oh, give me that. I might shoot 85, but I don't, I don't care. I want to go. Exp I, I want to go look at every shot with like max strategy, just not like bomb a driver and wedge it on the green to a green that goes slap. You know, I want to. I, I love yeah. letting the ball bounce around and and doing that kind of thing. So, it doesn't really matter where. Like I love the coastal stuff in England and Scotland and Ireland, but I, I'm jealous of your Australia events, mate. So one of these days, Stacy and Terry, and we're gonna go have this great golf down there because she's getting better. She can break a hundred now. So it's pretty cool. Yes. T t Terry whipped out a little 43 on us yesterday. Whoa. Right, Miss? She's getting good. She's getting That's... good. I've got, <laughs> I've got to tell you a quick story, okay? Um, everyone remembers the President's Cup, Royal yes. Melbourne. That's oh. kind of what we're talking about, okay? Yeah. The first hole where those players are driving it up on the front edge of the green and, and right around the green. When we play, where normal people hit it to, you've got about 100 yards. 
And mm -hmm. so all week long leading up to Royal Melbourne, we, we're playing golf courses that have got firm greens. And I keep going, don't worry. These greens aren't firm compared to Royal Melbourne. Okay. And so they're like, ah, oh, we, you know, well, the first hole at the Ryder Cup of the composite course is the third hole of Royal Melbourne West. So we get to the third hole and I'm playing with this lovely couple, these good friends of ours. And they've got like 100 to 110 yards into that green. And I'm like, guys, remember, okay, remember, just remember. So they hit nice shots and both of them land their ball next to the pin. <laughs> One of them had 42 yards coming back. <laughs> And the other had 48 coming back. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I know. It is, it is so much fun, Martin. You would totally, totally love it. I, I, I would put Australian golf, Australian golf courses ahead of anywhere else. And I've been fortunate to travel a lot. And, and we would certainly love to, to take you and your lovely wife, Stacey, along. That would be, that would be just epic fun. Epic fun. That'd be, that'd be good times. My favorite course to this day, seriously, still the one I grew up on, though. It's the National Golf Club in Toronto. I've heard that's it, amazing. It, it is. It's, a, it's an old George Fazio course. It's got elevation. It's got length. It's got a, it's got a pesky creek that kind of runs around through there. Um, it, you know, it's in great condition. I swear it's one of those courses that, you know, God said, just kind of went, poof, there you go. Yeah. And it's fantastic. Now they've had to tweak it a bit over the years and add some length because, you know, every, everybody bombs it so far now, yeah. except me. But, every, you know, it's like it's, one, it's still the course that if I had to go play my last round on, that's where I would, I would go play in Toronto at the National. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. I, I think if I had one round to play, I'd go Royal Melbourne West. And there you just, go. Just be a happy golfer. Just be a happy <laughs> golfer. Um, it's amazing. Good golf courses give golfers the sense that they can achieve. Sure. They don't, you know, anyone can build that 489 par four uphill with OB left and water right. And you stand on, I know I stand on that tee and I go, what kind of a miracle <laughs> am I going to perform to make a par here? Yes. <laughs> you know, but Royal Melbourne gives you that sense that you can achieve. And every one of the people that we took there walked off the golf course with this massive smile. Sure. No, I love Arthur, that. And I, it, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, like some designers, and when you go play, like, I, like Doak, Tom Doak courses are interesting to me. He usually gives you room off the tee to smash it around. Yes. And then based on where you smashed it changes the, the difficulty of how you approach the green. Yeah. Right. So I, I'm a fan of a, of a guy giving you some room to beat it around out there. And then if you're over here, you got a really hard shot. If you hit it kind of where he wants you to hit it, you have a better angle kind of thing. Yeah. I've, you know, Faldo has done some mo modern work that I think is really good. Um, you know, I think, yeah, really long and hard on every hole. That gets a little, te a little tedious. Like, I, I'm anyway. good. I'm good. Yeah. We'll, we'll go play somewhere else. Martin, one last question. We've got a couple minutes to go. I would love sure. for you to give, to share your parting thoughts with golfers and coaches pertaining to how you get your golfers to practice. When they leave your facility at the Raven, when they leave your golf school, what's the general picture you paint for them pertaining to practice? You know, I think that, um, I think practice is kind of, to some is like the gym membership. You know, they get all geeked up. They go join a gym. And then they go work really hard for a week and then light, their life gets in the way and practice for them is something that some people it's fun, some people it's not fun. So, I, you know, I'll tell people, I don't expect you to go practice a ton. I say, if you get some practice in, I like the, um, what, you know, what I've learned from you is breaking up practice into the, you know, skill swing and shot, some technique, some skill. Just in, is the skill piece, being silly on a range, it can be so much fun. Mm. And people don't realize just how valuable that is. So this, you know, technique, skill development, silly shots, and then some shots that have some meaning like, okay, I'm going to hit it, you know, to the left of that flag, to the right. And I've got, this is the, this is, this is a meaningful shot. I, I hit some, mm. got to hit some drivers the other day and every one of them I walked up to and I put myself on a hole I was familiar with that was a challenging t-ball hole for me mentally, even though it's just a range and I'm back here by myself. You know, I, I, I tried to build up the situation. I'm playing with so-and-so. I'm playing with Andrew Rice or I'm playing with damn Chris in Ireland and, and Steven. And, you know, this means something to get my nerves a bit up, you know. So I try to make my, put myself in a situation to make it fun, even, even though I'm alone. 
right? Mm. But a lot of people, like, they're just not practicers, and, and that's okay. And that's why if you teach them the right priming move behind every shot, and not to say to take a long time to play golf, don't, but if you're working on, you know, this kind of sensation in your arm mm. or, a, you know, you can, you can compound, you know, skill, compound your development by just doing something nicely time after time after time after time behind the golf ball. So mm. I say, if you play 10 rounds of golf and you hit 40 golf shots every time you play golf, there's 40, so there's 400. So if you're working on this sense of trail arm, you go up to the top and you pause and you kind of feel that, great. You've done it 400 times in 10 rounds. Guess what? You're probably a little bit better, right? So some people are ball hitters, fine. Some people aren't. That's fine, too. You can still get better. Now, you're not going to get as good as the per person who has the gets out to the range and has the three pillars of good practice, skill, swing, and shot. But, you know, if you prime it before you hit it and you know yeah. what your goal is with a good coach, you're going to get better even without a ton of range time. Mm. Everyone's situation is different. And that, I, love, I love how you went about that. Um, thanks so much, Martin. You are the man. I'm missing <laughs> you, brother. Uh, I wish we could get together and have a couple of beers and maybe go out for a dinner, maybe one of these days. I know the next time we get to do that, we are going to appreciate it tenfold. Oh, amen, man. So hug your beautiful wife for me, and uh, we'll be in touch as always. Thanks, Bob. Send love to the fam, eh? Take care of yourself, man. See you, buddy. Thanks Bye. so much, eh? Thanks, everybody.